This is you and you are at point A. Point A might look like an addiction to you. It might look like singleness. It might look like a dream to start a, a business for the Lord or a ministry or a, write a book for the Lord. And you wish you had the finances to do it. Right here, you wish you were at point B. You wish that you were married. You wish that you had that companion to walk with you, right? But if God, and, and, and I was talking to my best friend, Willa Lynn, who's also on YouTube, making YouTube uh, videos. She's amazing. But she was telling me, Jackie, a lot of people want to be from point A to point B, and they just want to go like that because we live in a popcorn society. That's how she put it. Uh, a microwave generation, right? We want everything instant gratification. They don't want to go through the process that God has for them. They don't trust the process. Right? We want to just get from point A to point B, and it's so true. I I I was at point A, right? And if if and I was screaming out to God, I was getting angry. I was like, God, I've waited so many years. What's going on? Why haven't you brought my spouse into my life? God, you you said that you, you know my my biggest dream was to have this ministry, and um you know it's been prophesied over my life so that I can tell many people about you and bring many people to your view. I want to do big things for your kingdom. Why haven't you made it happen? And if God had given me what he promised me in point B, in point A, I would have destroyed it. Before my husband could come at point B, I need to go through this process. Now, what does this process look like for me? It's sanctification. It is creating in me a faithful spirit. Because I had not let go of a lot of sin here right? Here, I was not letting go of sin. Here, I was still gossiping. I was still uh, going to parties and doing mushrooms and doing and smoking weed and saying, you know, and compromising, compromising the word of God. I was, uh, I had no fear of the Lord to depart from my evil. And I still had anger issues. I still had lust issues. So if, if God would have given me what was meant for me here in point B, in point A, and didn't bring me through the process, I would have destroyed that. You may have a ministry that God has called you to, right? But he hasn't given it to you yet because you would destroy it. Or you haven't been made faithful here. So if we're not faithful to God, what makes us think that we're going to be faithful to our spouse? We have unfaithfulness. We have a spirit of adultery. When we're cheating on God, we're cheating on God with sin. And we need to, we, we can't say, oh yeah, I'm going to be faithful to my spouse. And, 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 then, and then you're not faithful to God. It just doesn't work that way. People, and I didn't understand what marriage was. I thought marriage was flowers and daisies and, and the wedding and the cake and, and the pictures and everything. And it is all those wonderful things, but it is about dying to self. It is about literally putting that person before you all the time. Putting that person's well-being, putting that person's feelings. And obviously you take care of yourself, but you, if you're, if you're not dying to yourself for God, how are you going to die to yourself for a spouse? You're not. God needs to take you through this process to make you faithful. He did that for me. And now I'm able to be a faithful wife. I'm able to be a wife that can die to herself, right? And it's still an ongoing process. But I'm aware that this is what I need to do because God trained me to be a good spouse to him first. The Bible says in Isaiah 54, your maker is your husband. So trust the process. And a lot of times, you know... We, we, we want this ministry, but we're not even being faithful right here to give 10% of what God has given us. And I'm saying, I'm not saying that's a law. I'm not saying anything, but I'm saying, you know, we also have to give to the kingdom of God, to the things of God. We have to give to our brothers and sisters in Christ who are around us who are in need. Right? The Bible says if you see a brother or sister in Christ in need and you do not give them what they need and you just say, oh, I'll pray for you. But you don't give them the money that they need to pay the rent or whatever and they're struggling or food or, or water or clothing, then how does the love of God dwell in you? It doesn't. You know, at the end of the day, right, we, we need to be processed in order. We need to be tried through the fire. A lot of people say, God doesn't test you. Well, yes, God tests you and it's in the Bible. It's all over. Keep looking because it's there. God tests us to make our faith 
he tries it in fire to bring it out as gold. Okay. And um, God never tempts us, but he does test us to see if what we believe is what we believe. But anyways, I want you to open your Bible to Jeremiah 18. Okay. This is the potter's house. This is such an amazing chapter, y'all. And the Bible says we shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. You, when you don't eat this bread, when you don't eat this meat, when you don't eat, when you don't drink this milk, you are literally dying spiritually, okay? You need to always revive yourself. You need to be strong in the spirit. If you're not eating, how are you going to fight with, with an enemy? If you're not eating like physical food, how are you going to fight with an enemy? Somebody that comes in and tries to throw hands at you. You're going to be weak. And this, it's the same thing with the enemy. You need to pick up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You need to eat the word of God, right? And you need to let it transform and renew your mind. So uh, Jeremiah 18, and we're going to read, and this is crazy, guys. This is crazy what God showed me, and I know it's for one of you. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, this is what God was telling him. Arise and go to the potter's house and there I will cause you to hear my words. A lot of times we want to hear from God, but we're not willing to be obedient in the little requests. So God didn't tell him straight off the bat, Jeremiah, this is the word that I want. I want you to relate to everybody in Israel. No, he first said, go to the potter's house and there I'm going to tell you what to do. So we need to go from step to step to step. A lot of times God is like, uh, get rid of your pornography addiction with me. Let me clean you. Come to me. L surrender this to me. Fight with my power. Lean on me. And uh, then, you know, I will entrust you with a spouse. Right? Because if you only look at a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. It's the same with pornography. It is adultery against your spouse. And it will hurt your spouse and it will uh, destroy your marriage. So we want to get the wife, get the husband without taking the first step of obedience to the voice of God. Verse three, then I went down to the potter's house and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. So I did pottery in college. So this, this picture, he, he's coming to this potter's house and this person is on, you know, a wheel and he's, he's, you know, building something, some kind of vessel out of clay. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred, which means destroyed, in his hand, in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter? Saith the Lord, behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. A lot of times... You know, and we're here at point A. And we're a vessel for dishonorable use. I mean, we're literally, uh, you know, destroying our body with drugs. We're literally, you know, having sex outside of marriage and literally defiling our, our, our temple. And sex outside of marriage is just as bad as pornography. You can say, oh, I'm saving my soul for marriage and I'm saving my soul for that virgin wife. Yeah, but you're also watching pornography. You are committing adultery against your, uh, your, your future spouse. It's the same thing, right? So here at, at point A, you are this vessel that needs to be remade. You know, God puts new wine into new wineskins, not new wine into old wineskins because it's going to burst. So here, okay, you might be a vessel that, that, you know, you were in the world, you were doing all this stuff and God wants to make something new. Well, you know that quote, uh, and we always post it, but we don't want to go through it. <laughs> Bad things fall apart so good things can fall together. That's what's going on here. And God is creating a new vessel. He's creating you new and it seems like everything's falling apart. Like those friends are leaving you. Well, God God needs, you say, man, I got to get rid of this addiction. God, help me get rid of this, this addiction. But you, you're not willing to be obedient to shut the door on those friends who keep inviting you out to uh, inject yourself, to smoke weed, to do LSD. So uh, God, you know, he answers your prayer and he starts removing and stripping people from your life. And you're like, oh my gosh, how could this be happening? And it's like, you prayed for it. So a lot of times God mars us in his hands so he can create a new vessel, right? And 
we're like we're like a we're like a piece of clay we're like a piece of clay like a pot and a lot of times a pot and you, honestly a pot is never perfect and that's what i learned in in um pottery class is that a pot is never perfect there's always like a little thing that's you know a little different it could look great but god puts his glory puts his power like you know the power to cast out demons the power to heal the power to preach or the power whatever gift he gives you in someone that's imperfect a jar of clay for this reason second corinthians 4 7 but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to god and not to us when we are just a, a pot like think of like a you know kind of rusty pot it's not like beautiful or anything but it has the most beautiful flowers the most exotic flowers in the world none of the attention is going to the pot all the attention is going to the flower the flower gets all the glory right it's not taking attention away from the flower and god says he will not share his glory with another so and, I'm, and I have a point to this. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, And he said to me, God said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength, God's strength, my strength is made perfect in weakness. And then this is what Paul says, Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities or in my weaknesses that the power of Christ may rest on me. A lot of times we're like, man, I, I'm just not bold enough to, to, to speak, right? When God came to Moses and said, you're going to be my, my spokesperson. Well, I stutter, God, I, I, who made man's mouth? Who made the mute, the seeing, the blind, right? So a lot of times God chooses those who nobody thought could do it. He chooses you to do things that you feel like, man, I could never do this because when he does it through you, you and everybody else is going to know that it's only God's power through you and it has nothing to do with you. You're not going to get the credit. All attention is going to be on the flower. All attention is going to be on the Holy Spirit. So boast in your weakness. Man, I'm not bold enough. Well, God's going to make you bold. Keep praying. I, you know, God's called me, you know, to, to, to preach to the nations. Well, I just don't even know how to preach. Well, start, start reading his word. He's the one that teaches how to speak. He gives us words. He gives us a mouth. He created man's mouth. Don't disqualify yourself because of your weaknesses. God is going to use your weaknesses to bring himself more glory. So, So then, and we're going to keep going. So verse 7, at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it? If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. So God is saying, if there's a, if there's a, a kingdom, right, or a person who um is is doing really bad things evil things right and they're on their way to hell if they turn from that god is going to forgive them god's literally clean slate record clean <laughs> when god forgives he forgets okay he's not like us forgive and forget we say oh i can forgive you but i'll never forget well god forgets so you should forget right i should forget <laughs> and so god you know when somebody repents God's not going to bring this uh, wrath upon them, right? Because the blood of Jesus now covers them. But listen to this, verse 9. And what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. So God promises. He's like promising this kingdom. Hey, I'm going to build you up. I'm going to plant you. I'm going to prosper you. I'm going to. But he's saying, if you do evil, if you turn from your good ways and you do evil, I'm going to repent of the good that I said I was going to do to you. So a lot of times God promises us. He's, you know, he's like, yes, you know, you're not called to singleness. You're not given that gift of singleness. Cause some people have it like Paul. Uh, and and I, I, I'm going to give you a spouse, right? It's not good for a man to be alone. Or, um, 
you know, he, 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 he promises to entrust us with, you know, ministry, however God's, whatever God's promised you. And you say, okay, God, and you think, okay, because God said it, he's got to deliver no matter what I do. I'm going to go and defile myself and do all these things and rebellion and, and not even care. And it's, and this prophecy is going to come to pass no matter what. No. With your free will, you can reject a promise. You can reject a gift. You can reject a prophecy. You can literally stand in the way of your own promise, your own prophecy that God has given you. You can stand in the way because of your disobedience. And that's something I had to learn the hard way. I had to learn that the hard way. And I missed out on a lot because of my disobedience to the Lord. But praise the Lord that he corrected me and I am where I am today. <clears throat> now, therefore, go to speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you and devise a device against you. Return ye now every one from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good. So, the, uh, you know, and, and I'm going to just say this. A lot of people say, oh God, you know, in the Old Testament, he's totally different. And he was a God of wrath. Well, God is a God of love, but he's also a God of justice. And there is wrath because he hates sin. And you can't be love. God is love. You can't be love without hating sin. It's impossible. You have to because sin is evil and it goes against love. So, but if, if God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. That's what the Bible says. And if you read in Revelation, same God of wrath, right? He's a God of love, but he's also to be revered. He's also to be respected and feared. So, um, a lot of people, a lot of people say, oh, God was quick to, you know, bring judgment and, 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 you know, destroy kingdoms. If you read the Bible, he sent prophet after prophet after prophet after to warn and warn. And he was so long suffering. And you know what Israel was doing? Even in the time of Jeremiah, they were sacrificing their children to Baal. That's crazy. And God was so long suffering. He didn't destroy them. <sighs> but eventually, you know, warning after warning, he, we don't listen. You know, God has to bring correction or he has to bring justice. So... Um, anyways, what I was saying was, and there is hope, but we will walk. Okay. So he's saying, okay, so these people in the time of Jeremiah, they are, like I said, sacrificing their children to Baal and it's not good. And so he says there, uh, so he's like, look, you guys need to repent. Go and speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you. Return ye now, everyone from his evil way, and make your ways and your doings good. So he's warning them. Just repent. I'll forgive you. It doesn't matter what you've done. I love you. I forgive, I'll forgive you. I am so quick to forgive. But you have to turn from your evil ways. And they said, this is their response, There is no hope. But we will walk after our own devices and we will, everyone, do the imagination of his heart. And I did that before. When I was backslidden from the Lord, I knew that all I had to do it was one step away, one breath away, one prayer away from God. You know, James 4, 8, draw close to God and he'll draw close to you. But I was still uh, wanting to do what I wanted to do. So I'd just be like, oh, there's no hope. He's never going to forgive me. And it was an excuse. Think about it like this. You're in class right? And you have flunked this class. I mean, this teacher's like, look, you didn't turn on anything. You're about to fail. And it's the end of, you know, the, the semester. But if you do this five page essay on Abraham Lincoln, oh my gosh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll let you pass with a C. And you say, man, I just, I can't do that. That's too hard. I, you know, uh, there's no hope, you know, I'm just going to continue in my same ways of not doing anything and not turning anything in. So there's no hope and I'm just going to fail. And, you know, I'm just, you know, that is an excuse to say, oh, there's no hope. I'm going to keep walking after my own lust. That's an excuse. God gives us chances and he does warn us before things happen, um, before destruction comes a warning. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, ask ye now among the heathen who hath heard such things, the virgin of Israel has done a very horrible thing. Will a man leave the snow of Lebanon, which comes from the rock of the field? Or shall the cold flowing waters that come from another place be forsaken? Verse 15, because my people have forgotten me, they have burned incense to vanity and they have caused them to stumble 
in their ways from the ancient paths to walk in paths in a way not cast up. So they're burning incense to other gods. They're not going to profit them. They're not going to save them in the day of calamity. These gods profit them nothing. And they're burning incense to vanity. What happens? The incense is very expensive. Okay, very expensive during this time. Very so you are wasting all your money on a God that is not going to save you, that's not going to profit you. A lot of times, instead of going to God, we just go to something to numb us. I did. Going to weed, going to drugs, going to partying, going to sex to numb the pain. And it's not going to profit you. It's actually going, these gods are going to turn their back against you. These things that you put your hope in. Weed is a false peace. And it's like my mentor Sylvia said, weed, people say, oh, is weed a sin? which I have a whole video to make on that. I used to work at a medical marijuana dispensary. So I know all the anatomy of the plant. I used to be a big pothead. But anyways, um, you know, is weed a sin? Well, let's go back to Genesis. And this is what my, my uh, mentor Sylvia taught me. Let's go back to Genesis. Genesis, it says, God says, I give man dominion over all the plants. And that was part of it. Like we, were, we had dominion over the animals and dominion over the plants made in the image of God, right? Well, when the plant has dominion over you, then something's wrong. When she said that, I was like, mind blown. It is, it goes completely against creation. So, um, and the, and the way that it's supposed to be, the plant literally has control of you. And if you think that you're not addicted and, you know, people say, oh, I'm not addicted, I could stop at any time. Well, you're wasting like thousands and thousands of dollars a year on weed and that's literally what you spend all your paycheck on and you're wasting all your money you're burning incense to vanity and you're getting a false peace which is weed and it's not jesus and it's not going to profit you in the end it's actually going to lead you off the path of god uh so 16 to make their land desolate and a perpetual hissing everyone that passes by shall be astonished and wag his head so we continue in this wickedness and we say, oh God, you know, promise me this ministry. And I had a pastor and I'm not going to name names, but I had a pastor who would say, you know, he, unfortunately, he just had a, a big problem with pride. And he would say, you know, uh, you guys, you know, you guys have me here, but eventually God's going to blow up my ministry and I'm going to be before millions of people. And, and this is what God's prophesied over my life. And uh, you know, it's going to be hard to contact me. So take advantage that you have my number now, because at that point, you're not even going to be able to touch me. That, y'all, it's Christianity vanity. Like, we cannot get to the point where we're literally thinking, oh, I'm, I'm anointed and, you know, don't touch God's anointed. You know, people say that. Don't touch God's anointed. Well, yeah, but, you know, God can promise you all that, but you're literally in pride. You're hurting people. And this pastor was uh, hurting people. And, and I had to, you know, lovingly talk to him, but it, it just, he didn't listen. Um, unfortunately, when you get to that, when you get to different, like, leadership positions, you don't listen to rebuke. Um, and that's really, really important that you continue to be humble and listen to any kind of, you know, not rebuke, you know, but just like correction. You know, if somebody comes, hey, you know, that you hurt me in this way. But anyways, that's besides the point. Um, it's Christianity vanity. We, we, we seek God and we do the things of God and we look in his word so that God will give us a platform. Y'all, <laughs> that is so dangerous. That is so dangerous because we're looking for glory and it's vain glory. It's not glory for the Lord and it's not the right intentions. Um, so people are going to pass by and they're going to just wag their head. Verse 16, they're just going to wag their head. They're going to be a perpetual hissing. Wow. I will scatter them as with an east wind before the enemy. I will show them the back and not the face in the day of their calamity. Yet they say, come and let us device, devise devices against Jeremiah. For the law shall not perish from the priest, nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. Come and let us smite him with the tongue. And let us not give heed to any of his words. We need to be very careful who we speak against. 
Speaking against a brother or sister in Christ in judgment is extremely dangerous um, when, you know, they're not in the wrong or whatever it is. God um, has corrected me before of, you know, speaking a, a word of criticism against a brother or sister in Christ, you know, and we can smite somebody with the tongue. Well, them doing this, Jeremiah cried out to the Lord and the Lord got very upset and he defended his, his prophet, Jeremiah. So we need to be careful who we're talking against because God is a defender. He's like that friend that defends. And if anybody's talking against you and speaking against you, let me tell you, God will rise up and defend you if you will give um, place to his wrath. And we pray for mercy. We, we pray for them to be convicted um, and to turn from their evil ways. But um, God, God does not play when it comes to his children. He defends his children and he is a defender. So, you know, if, God, if anyone's spoken against you and, and said false accusations or whatever it is, you know, just know that the Lord, um, the Lord is going to defend you. So I just want to emphasize lastly about point A to point B, right? And I totally sympathize with anybody that's like, I don't want to go through this process. It's so long. It, you know, I don't know how long it is and everything, but you can trust God that he's preparing you and, and actually having your back by not giving you point B, you know, the spouse, the ministry, whatever it is in point A. And, um, you know, we need to make sure that we're faithful in the little to be given the much. And we have the right intentions. You know, when it comes to ministry, um, you know, if, if God can't trust you with the, with the money that you're giving now or the money that you're making now to give to him to be a good steward and not spend it all, how is he going to give you the much? Because you can't steal from the Lord. You know, you can't you can't steal from him. At the end of the day, he gave you that money and you should, I'm not saying 10%, whatever, but you should be giving to the Lord. Um, and so the point is, um, also, you know, you, if you want a ministry and you're over here and you're still not able to get past your, your family's criticism, God a lot of times puts prophets through criticism um, you know, uh, God doesn't put us through criticism. I'm sorry. God, and I, God allows us to go through certain trials to prepare us for, uh, you know, where he's taking us. For example, David, David, um, before he beat Goliath, he took care of sheep and he was confronted with a bear and with a lion that was trying to take the sheep. And he he killed them both with a slingshot and God delivered them into his hands. And when it came to Goliath, he said, I know that God's going to deliver Goliath into my hand because he delivered the bear and the lion into my hand. So a lot of times God prepares us uh, through different uh, trials, right? He allows different trials so that we can face the next one with faith, knowing that he always delivers. The, the um, afflictions of the righteous are many, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. So... If you are going through a process right now, trust the process. Don't think God is just, you know, um, allowing you to go through different things and suffering um, for no reason. Uh, he allows certain things for our good and he uses what the enemy means for evil for our good. And it says in the word that Jesus learned obedience through the things which he suffered. I learned obedience because I kept going into ungodly relationships because I didn't want to be alone. And, you know, I had a lot of consequences for that. Um, a man that God literally warned me about in a dream in detail before I ever met him months before. Um, I disobeyed the Lord and I knew that I was with the wrong person. And I actually remembered the dream once I was dating him, some signs were shown and I was like, oh my gosh, it's a guy from the dream that God warned me about. And I continue to disobey the Lord and stay with this person who was not a believer, claimed to be a Christian, but was not. Um, and he ended up raping me twice. And I went through a lot of heartbreak and a lot of abuse mentally. So I'm not saying God, God, God did that, but he did warn me to get away from this person. And I did not listen. So he never wanted that to happen to me, but I disobeyed. So 
I'm going on a tangent. But y'all, this is um, this is a message of hope. I really hope that um, you can have faith in the plan, in the plan that God has for you, and be content in, in point A, because point B is beautiful, and this process is good for you. So God loves you. Uh, trust the process and trust the Lord. He he's got beautiful plans for you, according to Jeremiah twenty nine eleven.